a sermon on transition. Uh, the people of Israel uh, had been taken into captivity. They had cried out to God. God heard their prayers and uh, he sent Moses to deliver them. And so Moses went to Pharaoh and there were a number of uh, plagues that happened, including uh, last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, the loss of the firstborns. And the only ones that were spared that loss were those that had lamb's blood on their doorpost. But finally, Pharaoh had had enough and they sent out the, uh, the uh, people of Israel. And the other people of Egypt were so happy to get rid of them at this point because they'd suffered so much that they actually sent them out with gold. And they go out and uh, not, no sooner than they leave Egypt that they start complaining when they get to, you know, the sea and chariots are not chasing them. And they start complaining, God delivers them across the sea and all that. And so everything, you know, works out. And then, you know, we, we've talked about all the things that they've done in the time. And uh, I think the, uh, the people of Israel who are very much like me, I would say us, but I'll, I'll just keep it to me. I'm having a little bit of trouble here with this uh, wanting to pull down. Okay. Um, they were grumblers and complainers. Um, they wanted what they wanted from God and nothing else. It's like, God, give me this on a silver platter the way that I want it. Now. And we all do that. And God, in his wisdom, sometimes grants us things, but not always the way that we think they should be. Or they don't always look like the way that we thought that they ought to do. And so we come up with our plans and we, we come to him and ask him to bless our endeavors. Uh, we ask him to bless us over other people. We want him to do things on our table, like she said, and now. And we get angry when we have to wait for different answers to our prayers or when he answers them in a different way than we want it answered. So one of the things that we have to look at with the people of Israel is that they wanted to do it their way. And aren't we the same thing? Our pride gets in the way. We take great pride in our abilities. We take great pride in, in our knowledge and in, in our wisdom. And uh, we, we think very clever when we put plans together. You know, the business world tells us, okay, you've got to have a business plan. You've got to have a three-year plan. You've got to have a five-year plan and all that. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing except when you do it in your own wisdom and with just your own knowledge. You know, and so many Christians think, okay, this is the way that you do it in the business world, so this is the way that we need to do it too. And so they put together a three-year plan and a five-year plan, and then they present it to God and go, looky here what I did. Bless it now. And you know what they say about when man makes plans, right? God laughs. Now, I want to make sure that we understand that making plans or being forward-thinking is not a bad thing. I think it is an important thing. Um, but I think that it's, it's the kind of thing that is fruitful when we ask the Holy Spirit to come and to direct us, to direct our thoughts to give us wisdom, to give us the knowledge to do things. And we kept, keep on checking with God. Okay, God, I think I'm hearing this for you. Okay, so we're going to put this plan together. Is, is this what you want? Okay, if, if this is step one, okay, now show me step two. And so we can have plans that go out months, years, if they are plans that are led by God, that are inspired by God. In fact, I think that, that a lot of people think that 
spirit that living is just all spirit of the moment that you only wait until the moment happens and okay god tell me what to do now and so and i think that's a bit presumptuous that god is just going to you know okay i need you now i need you now i need you now tell me now instead of saying okay god you have a plan for my life you have a plan for my life i want to participate in that plan can you share parts of it with me and then we can actually prepare we, we can do some positive work so it's important to understand that um, it's not plans that I'm against it's just plans that we come up with and we ask God to bless them because of our pride well you know I've got I've got a PhD in this or or I've had 20 years of experience in that I know what I'm doing I think that when we make our own plans and we ask God to bless them, there's a lot of pride in that. When we think that we know what's best, when we have situations that arise where, okay, I, I really, really, really want to do this. So let me put a plan around that and then go to God and ask him to bless it. The other part of pride is sometimes... When God does tell us to do things and we go out and do those things but either take the credit or we do it our way. Perfect example of that is you have Moses when the people of, of Israel are asking for water. God told them to speak to the water, to the rock, and water would spring from it. But Moses was so ticked off at these people, these stiff-necked people, these jerks. <laughs> I mean, he had to put up with them for a long time, tell you. And all they did was grumble and complain. And so he got ticked off. And instead of doing what God told him to do, speak to the rock and water will flow. He berated the people for their complaining and he struck the rock in anger as if it was him and his strength that was going to make the water come from the rock. He paid the price because he did what God told him to do in his way. He never got to see the promised land. What's important is to have not plans that we make. What's important is to have God's vision. The Bible tells us that without vision, the people perish. And I think that, you know, vision is something that comes from the Holy Spirit. Vision is something that all of a sudden you just, just kind of see, you know, like with the people of Israel. You know, they're, they're in front of the Red Sea and, and the Dead Sea, I think. It's Red Sea or Dead Sea? Red Sea. And the waters part. And so now you've got a clear vision to the other side. And so you know that it's okay to go. So having vision is important so that you don't end up wandering around aimlessly. But there's a difference between a plan that we come up with and a vision that comes from God, which serves as a guide to direct our steps. You know, as, as, as a staff at Jesus Church, we've, we've gone to God several times and, and we have uh, uh, a mission statement and we have vision statements and we have several different things that serve as our goal standard so that we know uh, th there's a plan that God's given us that tells us, okay, this is what we're going to do next. And we compare what we do against that which the Lord has given us. But the truth is that it's a lot easier, a lot easier to grumble and complain. Now, a moment of honesty. It's been now well over a year since the pandemic started. Be honest with yourself. 
and acknowledge that we've done a lot of grumbling and complaining about this pandemic. We've grumbled and complained about having to stay inside. We've grumbled and complained about not doing the things that we could always do. We've grumbled and complained about not being able to see people. I've grumbled and complained because I don't get to hug people. I'm Puerto Rican. I love to hug people. And just to, you know, do this, not the same thing. I want to hug you and... and well. So I've grumbled and complained. I've gotten ticked off. It's like, how long is this darn thing going to last? I've got so many things that I want to do, but I can't do because of, of COVID. And so we grumble and complain. So let me introduce you to the Tater family. Some of you are probably familiar with the Tater family, but if you're not, let me introduce you to the Tater family. Let's start with Uncle Commentator. He has a comment on everything. Everything. And, you know, he, he, anything anybody does or says, he's got a comment about it. And more often than not, it's a negative comment to put people in other place. He's that kind of commentator. He's got something to say about everything, and most of the time it's negative. And then we come to the father of the family, and that's dictator. Dictator is the father of the family, and everything has to be his way or the highway. Then you got spectator. This is the one that is always watching from the sidelines, doesn't initiate anything, doesn't participate. They're content to let others do, and they just stand back and they just watch. And you know that in their minds, they're not just watching, they're criticizing, right? And then you've got imitator. She is the daughter that just wants to see what social media has to say before she forms an opinion. You know, that, that fear of missing out. She's on social media all the time, and if something is in, then she does it. If not, she doesn't have it, want any part to do it. She mimics the world. Her friends often sway her opinions because she, she wants to make sure she, she doesn't become unpopular or anybody says anything bad about her on social media. So she's an imitator. And then you've got one of the sons, and his name is Agitator. Agitator is the angry son, you know, that teenager, who must, who must have inherited the spicy Irish tater genes. It, it tends to mash, scalp, or fry any tater that gets in the way of his plans. His parents blame his bad behavior on a, f a bullish friend at school, Irritator. And then you've got the younger uh, brother, Regurgitator. Um, he's the younger brother of Agitator. We call him Tater Tot. <laughs> uh, he tends to tattletale. He hurls up information quicker, quicker than a baby spews up their bottle. Uh, Reggie feeds off of gossips and lies for his own satisfaction. And finally, we got the mama of the bunch. That's Gravitator. She is large and in charge. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> Big mama has control and stay out of her way even as her family is falling apart. She finds a way to contribute by butting herself into everybody's business. So now... Uh, the people of Israel have become the Tater family. And because they become the Tater family, they end up spending 40 years in the desert. Here you got the, the Taters. <laughs> now, after 40 years, we have a situation where 
all those people that did all that grumbling and complaining, all those people that melted down that gold that the Egyptians had given them and created a golden calf to worship because Moses had been on the mountaintop for too long. So they created their own God to worship. All those people that groaned, mumbled, complained, and tatered their way around the desert, all those people had died off. And they're getting ready to cross the Jordan. Now, the Jordan at this point is like you see it here at flood stage. Now, I don't know if you've seen rivers of the Jordan. Uh, it's, it's, most of the time, it's very calm. In some parts, it's, it's pretty narrow and all that. But when it's on flood stage, it looks like this. It's wide. The water's coming down really fast. It's, it's overgrown its borders. And it is fierce. It is very fierce. But now there's a new generation that God has decided to take into his promised land. And so how will they respond? Will they respond like their ancestors and grumble and complain and fight fault and ask for somebody new to lead them? This new generation reacts differently. This new generation says, God is telling us to go. We're going to go. So the priests grab the, the ark and they start walking into this river. And as they start walking to the river, the Lord dries up the river upstream. And they take the ark right into the middle of the Jordan River. Not only does the water get dammed up upstream, but when you have a situation like that, if the water were to stop, what do you have? Mud, soot, and silt. But the Bible tells us they were able to cross on dry, firm land. They trusted God. God made a way for them. And so they go into... Um, into the promised land. And it's against this backdrop that now they're ready to begin occupied, the, uh, occupying the land. We talked about occupying last week. They're ready to start taking it on and it's so They're ready to start taking advantage of the, the, the milk and honey. Remember the big, huge bunch of grapes that had to be carried by two men? So they go into the promised land and up to this point, the Lord has been providing for them by giving them manna. The manna stops. And they have their first meal from the bounty of the promised land instead of eating manna. And they listen to God and they basically hold a service to God in the promised land. They decide to do things a different way. So let's look in our Bibles to Joshua chapter 5, starting with verse 13. Let me pause for a second to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we want to be like the children of Israel that entered the promised land and not like the children of Israel who left bondage in Egypt. Help us to see you part the waters for us. And help us to take a step of faith, knowing that you have a promised land for us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Joshua chapter 5, starting with verse 13, it said, um, they've gotten all their preparations done. They're about to go and conquer Jericho. Now, one of the things that you need to know is that a lot of the other enemies have already surrendered to the people of Israel because they've heard the news of how at flood stage, God stopped the water so that they could cross the Jordan and they were terrified. And they said, these people have God's protection. Let's not mess with them. So now they're deciding that they're going to go and conquer Jericho. So Joshua was near Jericho, and he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. 
Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you here for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy. So Joshua did. So we can do things our way in pride and arrogance and put all our plans together. Or we can come to God and say, What do I do? When does God show up? God shows up when we surrender. As as Pastor Carl prayed, when we come to the end of ourselves and we fall down and worship him. And so Joshua fell down in an act of surrender and worship. He humbled himself before Jesus. And by the way, most theologians believe that this man with the flaming sword is a pre-incarnate form of Jesus. Now, some people have an argument with this. Some people uh, think, well, no, that can't be Jesus because Jesus, you know, doesn't appear until, you know, the New Testament. Um, Sorry to break it to you, but Jesus was there at creation. Jesus is the word, and the word is what was spoken to create the world. How do I know that this is not just an angel? Well, if you go to Revelations uh, 22, 8 through 9, this is uh, John the Beloved who's on this island, he's seeing this vision of of the end times. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard them and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and prophets and all who keep the words of this book Don't worship me. I'm a created being just like you. Worship God. So if Joshua fell down and worshiped this man and that man didn't rebuke him, it means that he couldn't have been an angel, that it was God, that it was the pre-incarnate son of God. He worshiped him. He worshipped him. Without a moment's hesitation, he fell down and he worshipped them. So when does God show up? When we come to the end of ourselves, we surrender and worship him. And when we ask is what, we, what is required. Here in uh, uh, verse uh, 14, then Joshua fell down to the ground in reverence, worshipping him and asked, what do you want, Lord? What does my servant, what message does my Lord have for his servant? What do you want me to do? I am at your disposal. Now, Joshua has just taken over from Moses. He's brought the people into the promised land. And he's facing his second biggest hurdle. The first one was crossing the Jordan. God provided a way for that. His second biggest hurdle now is conquering Jericho. was a very a big, well-fortified city. And before this encounter, he's probably looking at the city and saying, how the heck are we supposed to do this? Because he's looking at the fortifications, he's looking at the size of the city, and he's, he's just got a lot of questions. And he's looking at stuff, and, and he's just probably going, hmm, God said to do it, but he hasn't quite told me yet how we're going to do it. 
So he's just looking at the city, and then this manifestation of God shows up. And so he says, okay, Lord, what you want me to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. With COVID, <clears throat> many of us had to work from home. Many of us spent a lot of time isolated. And we probably spent way too much time up here. And we probably spent too much time counting our problems, focusing on our problems, saying, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. Man, look at this mess. Is it ever going to get any better? This is terrible. I've never faced anything this bad in my entire life. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. But God doesn't want us looking at the problems he doesn't want us trying to spend time looking for solutions. He wants us to look at him. As men, we're, we're doers. We're, we're problem solvers. One of the, the things that um, you, you, you really learn very quickly, or if you haven't learned it yet, uh, learn it is that as, as a husband, when your wife comes to you and she shares a problem with you, she is not looking for you to solve it. She's not looking for an answer. She just wants you to say, I hear you, honey. I'm here with you. Come here. I'll hug you. I'll pray for you. If they want a solution after that, they say, what do you think we should do? That's a different, that's a different situation. But if they come to you with their problems, and all, they just want you to listen. And we want to do everything ourselves. We want to find the solution to the problem. We want to do something. And God is saying... Oh, let me embrace you. Let me hug you. Why don't you imitate John? John would, would lay with his head resting on Jesus' chest. They were that intimate. They were that close. He was called the Beloved. He was the only one of the apostles who was not martyred. God wants intimacy from us. He wants us to look to him, to ask what's required. And what is required, says the Old Testament, that we do justly, that we love mercy, that we abide in him. When does God show up? in the fullness of time. After 40 years getting rid of all the idolaters, making them completely dependent upon him, and raising up a new generation, God was finally ready to fulfill his promise of that promised land. The time had come, and he was ready not only to bring them into the promised land, but to reveal himself in power, wielding a flaming sword letting them know, hey, I brought you in here and now I'm going to do battle on your behalf. I can remember first reading this passage and it just really, you know, was one of those things where it just hits you. I love it when Joshua goes up to him a little bit tentative. Are you for us or are you for them? And he says, neither. As commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. I have come to take 
over not to take sides. We always want to take sides. We always want God to take our side. But he says, I'm on nobody's side. I've come to take over. Are you willing to let me take over? God doesn't show up to do our bidding. He comes to take over. He wants us to yield to him on the field of battle. He wants us to surrender control of his lives to him so that we're completely surrendered to him. So many of the struggles that we have are as a result of us trying to do stuff in our own strength, of our own power, in our own knowledge, in our own wisdom. We want to be in control, don't we? The thing that bugs us the, m- the most is not being able to be in control. So many wars have been fought over not being in control. So many fights, so many discussions because people just want to be in control. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Nobody can tell me that they know better than, than me what's right for my life. Isn't that the main argument in social media these days? Well, tell me what the Bible says. I know better what's for my life. What if I surrender control and he doesn't show up? If he hasn't shown up by now, what makes you think he's going to show up at all? God's not asking us to lose control. On the contrary, his word tells us that we are to be sober and self-controlled. God's spirit never causes anyone to lose control. What he does want is for us to surrender control and enjoy watching as he takes over and wins the battles for us. Then the Lord told him to do a strange thing. He told him to take off his shoes because where he was standing was holy ground. What was odd about this is that they were standing just outside of Jericho in the land of Canaan where they had worshipped pagan gods, where they, the people that inhabited that land, worshipped pagan gods. This is a pagan land. And yet, the commander of the army of God is telling him, take off your shoes because you're on holy land. Let me be completely honest with you. People have been asking me over the last few weeks how Jesus Church is doing, what I think of the new facilities. Are we going to be okay? We've talked with a number of families that have decided that they're moving on from Jesus Church. There's many that have just gotten out of habit to going to church altogether and may be a while if they ever come back. I know a lot of people out there in YouTube and Facebook land and all that I know that, that you're waiting for your shots or you're waiting for, for things to become normalized and all that. We know that, respect that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those that just can't be bothered to come or have made a choice to leave. And so when you look at things in the natural, there's cause for concern. Let's be real. Our offerings haven't been what they've been. Our numbers haven't been what they've been. And so it's easy to look at things in the natural and say, oh boy, we're in trouble. But see, we, for the last two or three years, have been praying about a promised land. We've been praying about praying for a place that's not the regent, 
where we don't have to set up and tear down every Sunday. We've been praying for a place that um, we, can't, we can use more than just four hours a week. We've been praying a place where we can you know, do things that can impact the whole community. We've been playing, praying for a place that God can just pour out his Holy Spirit and that we can, we, we, we can do whatever he wants. And we looked at buying places. We've looked at renting places. We've looked at all sorts of different scenarios. We have a whole team of people that's, that's in charge of doing that. And nothing panned out. Nothing. We thought we were getting close to some things, but then just the, the numbers just didn't add up. Until Pastor Ryan shared with Pastor Carl his vision for sharing this facility with another church because he thought it was not being utilized to its maximum potential. And then step by step, we've already shared some of the things that happened in, in some of the prophetic words that got us to this point right here, right now. We are in the promised land. So God is not going to abandon us. God is not going to forsake us now. He's got a plan for us. He's going to make us succeed. He's going to make us grow. He's going to make his spirit come and be poured out. So if you can, I realize that not all of you can. I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit out of the common. I want you to be like the people of Israel that crossed the Jordan into the promised land and not like the people of Israel who grumbled and complained ever since they left Egypt. And I want you to trust and have faith that this is the beginning of something awesome. So I would like you to take off your shoes and I would like you to come to the front. So what we're doing right now is we're acknowledging Jesus' command. Said, you are standing on holy ground. Take off your shoes and acknowledge that I have a plan and that I'm here to take over. All you got to do is sit back and watch. So put your hands out. Daddy God, we offer ourselves up to you as your willing servants, knowing that really of ourselves, we've got nothing to offer. But through Christ, we can do all things. In the power of your Holy Spirit, we can accomplish all things. And Father, we are thankful for this promised land. And so, Father, we praise you and we worship you. For you are God. Father, I pray right now that you would open up the spiritual eyes of each and every person here. 
that they could see the glory of what you have before us instead of what we can see in the natural. Take away the limitations. Let us see with your eyes so that we know that you have a plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. We're going to worship now.